Hello. I want to talk about financial technology, the future of what they call fintech. You know, finance and money is really a type of communication. Uh, basically, money follows the same laws that communication does. And that's one of the reasons why it is undergoing a huge amount of change because we understand that anything that can carry an electronic charge can carry a physical charge. And so these technologies of communication that we've made around the globe, including particularly the thing we carry in our pocket, the smartphone, are really become financial devices. They've become financial nodes. They've become um, the web that conducts just not bits, but bits that carry money. And so basically money is a kind of a bits, it's a, it's a bits with a financial charge on it. And um, all the weirdnesses of um, communications and the communication networks that we make, all that is transferred into the financial arena. And so what we're seeing is um, this new network economy coming about and um, it's uh, undergoing a lot of huge changes because we can transmit money as easily as we can transmit a hello message. So, I mean, the, 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 one of the very first things that we're seeing with um, in fintech and digital money and things like that, of course, is, is the cashless society, which has been talked about for a very long time. In fact, in Out of Control, way back in the early 90s, I talked about um, cryptocurrency and the fact that we were headed to a world where we didn't really have cash. And that seemed kind of implausible at the time. But um, in China, as you know, um, the world is operating almost without cash, and particularly among the younger people. Um, it's only sort of some of the older people and tourists who don't have any uh, electronic payment money, and they're kind of really, really, um, it's become very difficult to try to use cash in a society like China. But in fact, China is not the most cashless society. Sweden has even less cash, or I should say higher percentage of all the transactions done in Sweden involve no cash at all. And so we are rapidly coming to a state where um, cash will not be very prevalent in many of the economies of the world. And that's just kind of one elemental and fairly um, mundane change. Not much changes be beyond that, but it does allow, um, for one thing, it does allow the velocity of, of exchanges to accelerate because it becomes so easy to make a transaction. And you can make a transaction in physical life, you can make a transaction in the virtual life. Um, and that acceleration is, is very, very important, but it's relatively minor. The thing about um, digital cash and the cash to society is that you can now add to it many of the more sophisticated functions that we have evolved in the higher finance world that took a lot of time, that were very laborious, that maybe had a lot of regulatory oversight. We, we can bring them into this new realm of digital money and um, they can become quite prevalent and uh, optimized there. So for instance, let me just take an example of um, charging interest. Charging interest was something that banks did and only banks. Um, they lend out money and they charge interest and you pay back money. Or maybe um, sharks, you know, loan sharks would do that too. Um, but that kind of a function of just adding interest to some exchange is something that's just a matter of code, just a matter of some bits. That could be added almost anywhere in this chain. And so in theory, you could have a way in which an individual could lend money to another individual and charge interest on that until it was paid back. And of course, that is the origin of the idea of the P2P, peer-to-peer -peer lending, which had a kind of an infamous run in China because there were many, many peer-to-peer -peer lending startups, and a lot of them were kind of fraudulent. 
showing that the it wasn't just the technology that you needed. You needed institutional oversight. You needed regulators. You needed security. You needed enforcement. And so those are also technologies that, if they're not present, can lead to, to fraud. But I still think that the idea of peer-to-peer -peer lending still is viable. You may not need 10 or 12 different companies doing it. Maybe one is suffice. But the point is, is that this is a function, a financial function, that was sort of liberated from its old staid role, and it could take place almost any and anywhere along the line as digital money moved. And just as what happened with peer-to-peer -peer lending or, lend or interest charging interest, you can imagine many other kind of financial tools that now are very sophisticated in the realm of the professionals migrating down to the amateurs, to the every person, and it becomes something that you just can drag and drop in this new world. Neobanks, a lot of the new banks, um, have taken this idea that they want to take one thing that the old banks used to do. Old banks were, were, were involved in lending money, doing mortgages, having a savings account, doing investment. There were 10 or 100 different things that these traditional banks did. And a lot of the newer neobanks are saying, I'm just going to do one of these. I'm going to do it really well. I'm going to do it better than, than a bank could do it. And they specialize in something very, very narrow. And so because it's easy to go to them, you don't have to walk down the street. You just click over. Um, a lot of these very specialized financial functions are becoming independent businesses. And I think we're going to see more and more of what the old cumbersome banks did um, be taken up by these narrow um, silos, these verticals, just trying to look at one thing, just savings account, nothing else, just money trans exchanges, currency exchanges, nothing else. And so um, uh, that's part of what we're going to see is the specialization, increased specialization where um, a, a group of people, institution, or organization will understand and, and optimize one aspect of the financial system that used to be done by these big, uh, large state banks. Um, another as another function that um, digital money and um, financial tech allows us to do is, is things that we've often dreamed about, which is like um, dynamic pricing. So. Um, in the old days, it was very difficult to track. If you had a store and you had, uh, you had items out for sale, they had a price tag on it. And um, before there were fixed prices, the price would depend on who was asking. That's why we had negotiation and bargaining. Then during the industrial era, we had fixed prices. And so the price of something was fixed. There wasn't the added um, transactional cost of having a negotiation of bargaining. You just paid the price or not. Um, but in fact, what you'd like to have is both, best of both worlds, we'd actually like to have that price be dependent on what the demand was for it that day or at large in other parts of the country. And so the price could change in a, a one particular object, the price would change in respect to all the other factors in the world. And we see that online where a lot of there's dynamic pricing where the price of something will change hourly or by the minute, depending on the demand, depending on the weather, depending on the availability and the inventory. And we can also, we're, gonna, we're beginning to see that in retail stores, physical stores, that also would have a digital price tag that would display the actual price at that moment. And so we can take that idea of digital pricing and extend it beyond just to the retail, but into the world of wholesale into the larger economy as a whole, where every single item would have a dynamic price. And not just for a lot, not just for a container of things, but each item itself might carry its own price. And in some ways that it's through blockchain or some other means, that the price of the object is carried along with that object itself. So it's married and can know what its price is. And that kind of even suggests a larger revolution in the idea of 
real-time accounting. So right now, most businesses operate on kind of a batch mode for accounting. Things are tallied up and they're settled, equalized, proofed at the end of the month, end of the week, end of the year to make sure everything uh, cancels out. But in fact, we're operating in kind of a real-time economy, a real-time world, and you want to have real-time accounting. You want to have the you want to have the entire accounting system, the the snapshot of where your what the money is, visible all times, twenty-four hours a day, anywhere in the world. And so um, that does not exist yet. There, there's there's the, the 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 technology, the conceptual challenges of trying to understand a very large, complicated, let's say a very large multinational, maybe a country, maybe even a smaller business, trying to understand the flow of money through that business in real time is a challenge. It's something that we don't know how to do yet, but we're on the way to figuring out and we have seen the many, many benefits that would come from that rather than getting a static picture that we actually have a real time instant picture. And then the question, it's like, it's like evaluating the health of an individual body. It's very hard to look at it in real time. You actually want to look at the trends and you want to see which way the trends are moving. And that's one of the ways that we're going to kind of use this X-ray of an organization in real time is we need some new tools for understanding that picture and tools for both gathering that information and processing and understanding it. But I think that's one of the frontiers in the fintech world is, is bringing a, um, an X-ray, a real-time X-ray into a company or a country so that we, have, um, we, we can see what the accounting is in real time. Another frontier that we're um, exploring in the fintech world is robo-advisors, AI, the role of AI in guiding where money goes. So as these systems become more and more complex, as a multinational becomes incredibly as complex as a rainforest, allotting resources becomes a real challenge. And we're going to use artificial intelligence to help us allot resources. They may not make final decisions, but they will make many decisions. And the idea is, is that they can process multi- high dimensional variance variables much better than a human mind can. And when we are trying to make trade-offs in the millions of different data points, an AI will help us do that, whether it's um, allotting cash flow, whether it's uh, helping us to make investments, whether it's to um, uh, figure out tax benefits and pluses, that AI is gonna become much, much more involved, the robo-advisor not just for individuals trying to um, figure out what they want to invest in for their retirement, but actually robo-advisors being used in running a company, the CTO, the CFO, excuse me, using a robo-advisor to help determine the best use of the resources in that company. And I think that's a huge um, growth for um, FinTech. And Lastly, I think um, there are still some cultural um, things that can be done, some societal things and governmental things that can be done with financial technology. And one of the ones um, that has been talked about is this idea that um, when a baby is born in a country, that baby would automatically get uh, some investment put into an investment account that would not yield or would not be accessible to them until they were coming of age at, say, 21. Um, and so that um, every person, when they come of age, um, has uh, some resources to do something. And that um, that individuals would, would be able to partake in the general prosperity of a country, and they would be sharing in the prosperity of the country and the prosperity of the civilization um, at birth, and that they would have, you know, maybe $2,000 invested in some fund, every person born, and that that would 
yield, whatever it might be, at the end of 21 years, it could be a very substantial sum given the world's growing prosperity. And that that sum would, would be theirs to use with no conditions. And so um, uh, this would be a way to kind of, again, redistribute the gains of a society at large so that every individual would have at least the possibility of doing something um, with that general prosperity. And so that's um, an example of bonds at birth, the bond being kind of like an investment vehicle, um, can be made much easier with the financial technology that we have right now. Um, and that's kind of a, a social decision, a social program beyond this technology. Uh, and so using other innovations in that, we can actually harness some of this financial technology for societal ends. So, so again, like in the P2P lending, it's not just the technology of the digital stuff that we want. We also want to have the technology of regulation, of oversight, of governmental programs. All these things are necessary when we're talking about money. And so I think there's tremendous innovation ahead of us in the world of, of financial technology.